Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh and welcome to another episode of the Talking Sira podcast. In our last episode we spoke about the miraculous nature of the Quran and we really highlighted that the, the miracle was actually in the linguistic miracle and the language of the Quran. And in Allah's hikmah what he would do um, is he would send miracles to prove the messengership of, of prophets and messengers uh, to people who excelled in the subject and, and excelled in the actual actual um, area of the miracle. So with the Arabs uh, and, and at the time of the Prophet wasallam, they in essence excelled and were experts in language and, and Ar- Arabic language in particular. However, they um, were unable, even in their brilliance and their excellence, they were unable to match the challenge that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had set for them, which was to produce a single chapter like the Qur'an. Um, but in their failure, rather than intellectual try and, trying to challenge and try to meet this, or, or at least accepting the fact that the Qur'an was from, from Allah, many of them, especially the leaders, uh, they resorted to slander and lies against Islam and against the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Uh, we also spoke about how the yaqeen, uh, the firm conviction in the Qur'an is what gave strength to the Sahaba and the, compa- the companions of the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And they took the Qur'an as a guidance, as, as a way to live their lives and not just a mere set of scriptures or books um, as we, we find many may do today. It was really their guidance, their, the way they, they lived their lives. And likewise, uh, we spoke about how we had to go through the same process of transformation, the same process of really um, understanding how the Qur'an was the miracle from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and proved the truth of Islam. And you know, after, after establishing that fact, how we need to look to the Qur'an and the Sunnah as our guidance uh, to, to live our lives and to understand how to solve our problems that we may come across in, in life. So... Moving on, really, um, we we just want to, in this episode, in today's episode, we just want to move on to the actual events in the seerah. Uh, now that we've discussed some some of the fundamentals, and and it really does ha- um, link back to uh, some of the things we spoke about in terms of the Qur- uh, the Quraysh rejecting the message and and how they resorted to, you know, a slander against the Messenger of Islam, but also attacks on Islam, both you know, both to the Messenger himself, but also the Sahaba. Um, and this was both ideological and um, physical, in that they tried to target the message of Islam and try to um, demonize the Muslims from accepting Islam, and and they would mock and try and to, try to really uh, knock the confidence of the Muslims. But also they resorted to physical abuse and physical attack against the Muslims, as we'll speak about how they tortured a lot of the Muslims and they persecuted and even killed. Uh, Muslims, the, the the weak Muslims especially. Um, so today, what we want to also do, rather than just kind of speak about the um, the attack the Muslims faced at the time of the Prophet Prophet Alaihi Wasallam, we want to also demonstrate how the same attack that the Muslims faced in the time of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is very very similar as as the attack we face today, both in terms of the ideological attack and the physical attack. Very similar. We can draw parallels from what the Muslims faced then to what we face now. And this is really important because if we're able to demonstrate this and establish that the attack on Islam we face today is the same or very similar to what the Messenger Wasallam and his companions faced, then we must also accept that if the Messenger Wasallam overcame these challenges and these problems, that we can do the same because they are pretty much the same problems and we must tread the same path that the messenger sallallahu alaihi wasallam and the companion his companions the sahaba radiyallahu anhum we have to tread the same path to overcome these challenges that we face today and we can't get distracted by following other course of action other solutions um, because we have uh, you know we have the solution in the seerah in the in islam itself so inshallah if we can demonstrate this we will will you know convince ourselves and not not only that you know we have to as an obligation and as a mandatory requirement as muslims follow the sunnah in in any, anything we do and follow islam but also by demonstrating that you know we don't really face anything different it's not not anything new the enemies of islam and enemies of allah 
have resorted to the same sort of attacks against his deen. And this will happen, you know, happen from day one, uh, the time of the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and it will happen all the way to the end of times. And they, they, they may change in terms of scale and style, but, but in essence, the basic attack on Islam remains very much the same. So what was the attack uh, or the attacks? Um, so what, you know, the Quraysh and, and the enemies of Allah, um, they resorted to many different types of attacks uh, to kind of challenge Islam, but not intellectually, but rather, um, you know, if, if they really did want to inte- intellectually challenge Islam, they would try to produce something like the Quran. But but like we spoke about last time, they, they failed, uh, you know, miserably failed. So because they were unable to do this, they um, started to target the message and idea of Islam um, in a mocking way and nothing intellectual, but uh, as, as good as they, you know, as they tried their best to keep people away from the message of Islam. Um, and they also resorted to that physical persecution as we, as we spoke about. And what I've done is, you know, try to categorize these attacks so that we can make some similarities and parallels with today. And I've come up with nine different categories uh, of these attacks. And, you know, that is quite a long, a large group. But, you know, you could make even further categories. You could pro- I probably missed quite a few as well. But just trying to fit in into this session, into this episode, um, we'll skim through what some of these attacks were and, and give some examples and also tie it back to, to what we face today. And what it really proves is that the enemies of Allah and the enemies of Islam, both then, uh, at the time of the Prophet Sallallahu and now, today, they take any opportunity they have to attack Islam, right? And they they will resort to the lowest kind of action to, to attack Islam and to mock Islam. And we'll find this. Even today they do this and they did this back then, as, as we'll find out today. So, as I said, there were nine separate categories. And inshallah, I just want to go through each of them, so explain some of what they did in the time of the Prophet Sallallahu and also how we find the same today. So, number one. Uh, mockery and ridicule. So the Quraysh would attempt to mock and rid- ridicule the message of Islam, and the Messenger sallallahu alaihi wasallam himself. And that their, you know, their aim and objective was really to degrade Islam and knock the confidence of the Muslims by, you know, joking about Islam, mocking it, ridiculing it, so that um, the the Muslims would feel embarrassed about accepting Islam, or they would feel like. They weren't upon the truth. Obviously, they knew they were, and we know the Sahaba were really strong in in this because of what we spoke about last time. They had that firm conviction and decisive belief in Islam. So Allah Subhanahu wa Taala says in Surah Al Furqan, "Wa idha ra'ouka in yatakidunaka illa huzwan, ahadat ahad al ladi baath Allahu Rasoola." And when they see you, O Muhammad, they take you not except in ridicule saying, is this the one whom Allah has sent as a messenger? So what they were really saying, as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is pointing out to us, is that they are saying, Did, you know, didn't Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala have anyone better to send as a messenger? Did they have to choose you? And they'd say this in ridicule, um, to make fun of the messenger sallallahu alayhi wa and mock him. Even though, you know, the messenger himself belonged to a noble family of in the Quraysh, Banu Hashim, and he had the most outstanding of you know character, and he was known to be Al Amin amongst the Quraysh society. But um, they would still continue to make fun of him, perhaps because he was an orphan and he wasn't the wealthiest or from the elite, so to speak. The way that he wasn't from the authority, but um, you know he he wasn't. He he still had that status, as as we know, um, Allah gave to him. So they would find anything and everything to try and mock the Messenger sallallahu alaihi wasallam in in any way they can. Likewise, we see today, you know, if we compare how the enemies of Islam mock Islam today as being backwards, as being, uh, you know, you know, they, they, they mock the fact that we believe in um, Islam as, you know, as a belief system um, because of this kind of really atheistic society we live in today, that there's, there's different times of, types of mocking, but it's very much the same. Um, they, they even mock some of our rules. For example, the hijab, they... Uh, they knock it and, and they say that this is oppressive towards women. They they knock the Sharia itself. They say that uh, it's backwards and not for today's time and call it barbaric and, and what have you. And subhanAllah, you know, just in the, the, the situation we find ourselves today where with COVID, um, it's, it's really interesting and ironic really that, you know, now th- there's rules and I think it's from next week even in Britain where 
will be obliged to wear masks uh, in public spaces and, and, and around when we, when we leave our homes. But, um, you know, when it came to niqab and when it came to hijab, they uh, were, were the first to kind of um, talk about security concerns and w- why it shouldn't be. And they wouldn't just say it in, in a serious way. They'd, they'd mock it and ridicule it, as, as Boris Johnson himself, you know, he called our sisters letterboxes. So this is a, is a mockery of Islam and mockery of the rules of Islam. And, you know, it really shows their hypocrisy in that now they are having to wear, wear the masks. And I think I saw something in the news about the French who, um, you know, don't allow you to wear the hijab in, in, in public spaces and public um, buildings. But now they are mandating for people to wear uh, the mask for COVID-19. So really, subhanAllah, this is a this really shows shows up, shows up the values and, and the hypocrisy they have in their hearts. And and the reason really they they hate Islam and hate they hate the rule of hijab is nothing to do with security and this this really proves that it's more about the fact that they realize that the hijab and and the 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 islamic dress really represents the fact that muslims want to refer to islam for their rules and their their solutions and and the way they live and they can't take this especially in france which is a very secular very very you know laicite secularism which is the purest form, form of secularism uh, many of them carry this thought so anything that is represented by religion and especially islam because you know they know it to be you know a bit more ardent against their beliefs and there's a bigger clash with their belief they they will say anything and everything to and mock it as as much as they can so you know another thing that we see that the quraysh back then would mock the messenger sallallahu alaihi wasallam and ridicule the messenger as we spoke about but even today, uh, this mockery continues of our Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and his character. And, you know, they claim the worst of things, na'udhu billah. And, you know, we don't need to really repeat what they say, but um, anything and everything, they try to knock the character and, and character assassinate the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. You know, we had the case with the Danish cartoons and the Charlie Hebdo drawings, which caused uproar in, 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 you know, in, in amongst Muslims, and, and rightly so, really. And, you know, they, their reasoning for, for this was that this is satire and it's just satirical magazines and things like this. But, you know, satire is exactly that, mockery and ridicule. That's exactly what satire means. But, um, you know, they, they brought Islam into it. They took our messenger, who was beloved to everyone, so someone who, you know, we love more than our parents. They brought uh, this, you know, this amazing best of mankind into this. So this is what they do. And they did it back then and they did it today. So... You know, it's nothing new um, and really highlights and demonstrates that, um, that they will always resort to this mockery and ridicule to try and, um, you know, mock Islam itself and, and, and knock the confidence and of the Muslims and try to embarrass the Muslims. But in the end, you know, alhamdulillah, that we have the strength of the truth and we know it to be the true truth. So number two um, really is the propaganda against Islam, which is very similar to the mockery, but this is more about how they use uh, the tools to to kind of create lies against Islam and propaganda. So two episodes ago, we spoke about how the Quraysh uh, would spread lies and propaganda against the Messenger sallallahu alaihi wasallam himself. You know, he, to keep people away from him and listen from listening to his message and even giving him an ear. Uh, they they would call him a madman, a liar, a magician, a sorcerer, a poet, anything and everything, as long as they couldn't call him a prophet of Allah or a messenger of Allah. Um, and these were just pure slander, you know. We spoke also spoke about how they themselves didn't believe this. Uh, when it came to the season of Hajj or just before Hajj, they wanted to unify their stance against the Messenger sallallahu alaihi wasallam. And one of their leaders, and who was a great poet himself, Al Walid bin Mughira, he, you know, himself was not convinced by all of these claims that the Quraysh was saying. And every time a suggestion was made, he would explain how the Messenger sallallahu alaihi wasallam never fit into this category of, of whether he be a sorcerer, a liar, a magician, not none of it, even a poet. Uh, what Al Walid bin Magara said and he claimed that, you know, the Messenger of Sallam doesn't follow any of these uh, characteristics. But in the end, in desperation, they had to come to a unified position. So they decided that the Messenger of Sallam was a sorcerer um, who breaks up families, you know, and even though they knew that this was not believable, they had to unify that position. And this kind of propaganda against the Messenger of Allah and against Islam is nothing new. Again, we see something very similar today. Uh, the enemies of Allah, you know, they use their media machine to spread propaganda against Islam and its noble concepts. 
So, you know, they will spread lies about Islam being violent and all about terrorism and attacking people and extreme and whatever words they want to use. But they want to present Islam in a very negative light. And it's, it's to achieve the same objective, to keep people away from listening to the truth, to knock the confidence of, of Muslims. So, you know, back then the Quraysh would do the same so that people wouldn't listen to the messenger. And today they do the, you know, the West and, and the enemies of Islam do the same today to, to kind of paint Islam in a very negative light. Likewise, they, you know, noble concepts within Islam that we Muslims know are noble and true. For example, jihad and khilafa. You know, the West have dragged these concepts through the mud. Um, by you know utilizing whatever tool they had necessary, whether it be setting up a group, whether using their media machine, anything and everything, um, just saying the word jihad now brings up negative connotations, even amongst Muslims. So even Muslims don't want to speak about it, or they call it the J word, or whatever it may be. But alhamdulillah, I think um, it is changing, and Muslims now realize, even after all this propaganda, that these these concepts are noble and and pure. And they are from the truth, and when they underst are understood correctly, they you know they liberate, liberate mankind. So alhamdulillah, even even with their you know their attempts to smear uh, Islam and the propaganda against Islam, the Ummah by and large knows the truth about these concepts. As as we saw recently with the conversion of Ayat Sophia, you know this move in fact increased the spirit of jihad and understanding of jihad. In the correct context, and how you know Muslims recognized uh, and realized that Islam is expansionary, um, and you know a, a great discussion was held with uh, you know about Muhammad al fatih which in his name itself is al fatih means the conqueror or the, the opener, who, who who was a person who opened and conquered Constantinople. So these discussions and these um, actions that are taking place on the on the political scene really highlight how Muslims are moving back towards understanding these concepts in the true sense. Um, and this is what they hate, you know, the, those um, Westerners who have come out against this decision, you know, by, you know, you know, in, on the face of it, they will talk about um, the violation of kind of a UNESCO site and it being a museum and all of this. But in fact, their hatred is the fact that they can't they they don't want to see Islam gain in any way, and with this move out of it becoming a masjid, which it was always meant to be a masjid, right? And uh, it was Mustafa Kamal himself, the the traitor who um, converted it to a museum when when he um, destroyed the Khilafah and he abolished the Khilafah. So now that it's kind of converted back, uh, the the, the non-Muslims in the West are, are not they're not really bothered that it's not a museum anymore. They they they're more bothered the fact that it's become a a mosque, and this is a massive uh, symbol, symbolism, and a, and a uh, and a really brave and bold action that we haven't seen in a very long time. And the Ummah yearns for actions like this, and it does, um, you know, raise that spirit and hope. Uh, and we do start to understand some of the concepts of Islam and what really Islam means uh, in a more comprehensive sense. Alhamdulillah, I think it is changing, despite all the propaganda, all the millions have spent. Uh, of propaganda against Islam, this this is uh, w what's happened. And again, like like we've said, it's nothing new. Um, it happened back then. Um, they they spread lies against Islam to to try and harm the the message of Islam and and the idea of Islam itself. But because it's the truth, you know, it's the truth that prevails, as Allah Subhanahu wa Taala tells us. And uh, even today, we find that this this the same thing happens. Propaganda will be spread. There will be a campaign, but the truth will always prevail. So number three, um, hindering the da'wah. This was another thing that the, the Quraysh did. Uh, they would place physical obstacles for people embracing or following Islam. You know, Abu Lahab, who was the uncle of the Prophet Sallallahu but he was a, a, a true enemy of Allah. He and his wife would do everything to put obstacles, physical obstacles actually, in the way of the Prophet Sallallahu in front of his home. Um, anything and everything that he, they could do to hinder his da'wah. And you know when the Messenger sallallahu alaihi wasallam would give da'wah in the marketplace, in the in the center of the near the Kaaba, Abu Lahab would always be close by, and try to undo the efforts of the Messenger sallallahu alaihi wasallam by speaking to people and telling them not to follow the Messenger. So he, so the Messenger would speak to someone and give them da'wah and you know really cause you know have have success in that da'wah. But what Abu Lahab would do would come back around and. 
uh, try to unconvince the people and try to hinder the da'wah that the Messenger had done. And one of the really good examples we have uh, in this uh, that highlights it really well is the story of Tufail al um which shows what the you know the extent the Quraysh really went to. He he was a, a man, a, a poet, a great poet from the tribe of Daus. And the Quraysh knew this, so they recognized that this man is, you know, he has a lot of influence. So they w- recognized in this, they uh, quickly pounced on him and went to him straight away. And he narrates himself, he says, you know, I approached Mecca and as soon as the Quraysh leaders saw me, they came up to me and gave me the most hearty welcome and accommodated me in a grand house. Their leaders and notables then gathered and said, O Tufail, uh, you have come to our town. This man who claims that he is the Rasul of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, has ruined our authority and shattered our community. We are afraid that he would undermine your authority among your people, so don't speak to him, You know, just don't listen to him. On no account listen to anything he has to say. He has the speech of a wizard causing division between father and son, between brother and brother, and between husband and wife. So subhanAllah, you know, the Quraysh did their utmost to try and... Uh, and show that Tufail didn't listen to the Messenger of because they knew that if he even listened to a little bit that the, uh, the Messenger of Allah said, uh, then he would be drawn to the message of Islam and convinced. So Tufail initially, because he was given such a welcome, he listened to the Quraysh and he went and did tawaf around the Kaaba and he p- placed cotton in his ears out of fear of hearing the words of the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. But as he got close to the Messenger, who was also there, um, he, you know, he said to himself, "You know, what are you doing, Tufail? You know, you're an intelligent, perceptive poet. You can distinguish between what's good and bad in poetry. What prevents you from listening to what this man, the Messenger of Allah, has to say? And you know, if what comes out of the messenger messenger is good, you'll accept it. And if it is bad, then reject it. You know, he recognized that. Why is he doing such a, a silly thing in terms of putting cotton in his ears, where he has the perception he is able to know what's right and wrong and has a mind to kind of come up with it himself. So why is he listening to what the Quraysh um, told him to do? So anyway, as the story goes on, he he said, I remained there until Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi left for his home. So he followed him. I followed him as he entered his house and I entered also and said, O oh Muhammad, your people have said certain things to, to me about you. By Allah, they kept on frightening me away from your message so that I even blocked my ears to keep out your words. Despite this, Allah caused me to hear something of it, and I found it good. So Allah caused a little bit for him to hear, you know, he couldn't fully block it out. So he says, tell me more about your mission. So the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam recited to me Surah Al-Ikhlas and Surah Al-Falaq, and he said, I swear by Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Taala, I had never heard such beautiful words before. Neither was a more noble or just mission ever described to me. Thereupon I stretched out my hand and gave him allegiance and testified that there is no God but Allah and Muhammad is, his messenger, is the messenger of Allah and this is how I entered Islam. So Tufayl al-Dawsi really um, this shows you that despite uh, the Quraysh trying to hinder the da'wah and try to convince people not to listen, this man he really showed that he was sincere and even though he kind of listened to the uh, Quraysh initially, he was sincere to the message and when he heard that message, he knew it to be true. And subhanAllah, what did he do? He went back to his tribe of Daws and called them to Islam. And one of the most famous companions of the Messenger Sallallahu actually became a Muslim through the da'wah of Tufayl al uh, None other than Abu Huraira, who is uh, you know, one of the utmost uh, uh, Sahaba himself. And, and even we give a lot of credit to the Sahaba because, as we do to all Sahaba, but mainly... One of the reasons Abu Huraira is special to us is that he has narrated the most number of hadith. So, you know, our Islam is owed to Abu Huraira and and indirectly to to, to Fayl al-Dawsi as well, who who actually, um, you know, it was through him that Abu Huraira became a Muslim. So, you know, the Quraysh did their utmost to hinder the da'wah and, and the efforts of Muhammad Sallam, they, they tried to undo them as as, as e- any way they could find, they tried to undo the, the efforts of Muhammad Sallam. And... Even we find the same today, really. Uh, Dayis and dawah carriers will, will tell you, you know, they work assiduously, you know, as we try to, you know, give the message of Islam in the correct way and the understanding of Islam in the correct manner, in a comprehensive manner. But, you know, you will find people who will come and try to undo the efforts of the da'wah. 
um, but not on an intellectual level. You know, intellectual arguments and intellectual debate is is fine and good, and you know that that you know we should be open to that because we know we have the truth. But in fact, many of these people resort to personal attacks and scare tactics and try to keep Muslims away from listening to the true message of Islam. And one of the key aims of the West's CVE strategy, countering violent extremism strategy, and the Prevent scheme, which is a, a you know a parent of or a child of that wider strategy in the UK, you know, is to keep Muslims away from understanding Islam in a comprehensive and sense and in the correct sense, from understanding Islam to be a political, uh, ideological kind of um, perspective. From that perspective, um, they they just want Muslims to accept it as a ri- ritual. Uh, religion and something that is purely personal so that you know many muslims and um, you will find there's many agents amongst us who will use dirty tactics to undermine the dawah and subhanallah even the, through the prevent scheme um, the governments will actually fund imams in themselves um, not uh, not every imam of course there's many good imams but many imams would have been convinced to work with prevent uh, to to undermine the dawah so it really highlights that this is another example that you know, back then they would try different means and styles to kind of hinder the that one. And today we have the the very same thing. It might, again, it might be a little bit different, but the basis is the same. The enemies of Allah today seek to hinder the dawah in a very similar manner as the enemies of the past. So, number four, you know, one other thing they used to do, the Quraysh, would to pressure to compromise. You know, they would try to pressurize the Messenger of Allah to compro- compromise his message and, and water down the message of Islam. So the, the people of Quraysh once came to the Messenger of Allah and said, you know, let's make a deal. Uh, we'll agree to worship Allah for one day and you worship our gods for another day. And the Messenger of Allah, when he heard this, said, you know, I'd never do such a thing. I'd never agree to such a thing. So they came back later, you know, they compromised a little bit from their side and they said, you know, we have a better offer to make. We will worship Allah for a week and you worship our gods for one day. And the Messenger of obviously said, no, you know, I would never, ever, even one day, I will not worship your uh, your gods, even if you worship mine for a week. Then they came back again, and it was a better offer. They said, you know, we'll worship Allah for a month. You just give us one day of worshipping our, uh, you know, our gods. And Rasulullah, as we know, he said, no, you know, I, I won't do this. And he didn't compromise, because even though they would pressurise him and try to get him to compromise the deen and, you know, you know, it may have been some sort of benefit in that um, he could kind of unify the people of Mecca, but no chance was the Messenger of Allah ever going to compromise his mission, even if it meant hardship, even if it meant that there were little Muslims that were becoming Muslim and, and accepting the message of Islam. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed the ayah uh, where he said that, you know, they would wish that you would compromise so that they could compromise with you. You know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling us that the, the enemies of Allah, they want us to compromise. Um, they want us to water down the deen. They want to reform Islam so that we would compromise with them. And eventually, you know, what happens is that one compromise you make, it becomes more compromise and Islam is lost altogether. Uh, one other thing the Quraysh would do is they'd use the uncle of the Prophet sallam, Abu Talib, to pressurize him to stop, the, you know, spreading Islam and doing his, giving his da'wah. And they, you know, they they came to Abu Talib and they'll tell him that your your nephew he's causing disruption, and you know, can you ask him to stop? So Abu Talib once came to the Prophet and said, "Look, your people are complaining that you're disrupting and disturbing their meeting. So why don't you stop?" And what did the Messenger of say? He said, "Oh, my uncle, do you see the sun?" And he said, "Yes." And the Messenger of replied, "You know, I am no more capable of stopping that than you are getting." me a flame from it basically saying that look i can't it's impossible for me to stop what i'm doing i'm on this mission allah has sent me and i have to do it and you know it's impossible for him to leave it and in another narration he said if they put the sun on my right hand and the moon on my left hand i will not give up this matter until allah subhanahu, subhanahu wa ta'ala judges or i lose my life so this really highlights that there is no compromise and the messenger of never ever compromised and his uncle responded when he heard this, you know, oh, my nephew, you're telling the truth. I believe you go ahead and continue. So he did support him in that. But you can t- you can see how the Quraysh, they would use his family members to pressurize uh, the messenger. Sallallahu and similar today, it happens, you know, they use our women folk, try to scare, uh, use scare tactics and say that, you know, uh, you know, we need to 
stop our children from becoming radicalized they use the word you know and we we should know that they will use these underhand tactics and they did back then and they'll do it today so when it comes to the pressure to compromise uh, we find that the messenger sallallahu alaihi wasallam really you know stood firm and he wasn't willing to budge at all and that is the reality of truth you know we we can't we have that truth and we know it is the haq and an inch towards falsehood you know we would lose that truth and the messenger sallallahu alaihi wasallam obviously he re- recognized this and he had no choice uh, even though you know the quraysh they compromised nearly everything they were willing to uh, you know uh, worship allah for a month as long as muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam worshiped their lords for one day and when it comes to falsehood you know they can easily compromise you know they have that choice because they're already upon th- falsehood and one inch or you know even two inches or a mile in in the opposite opposite direction doesn't really change anything they're still upon falsehood but when it comes to truth and the huck even an inch towards falsehood what what happens is we lose the whole of the truth you know that 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 truth doesn't remain the truth anymore and that's why uh, the messenger of Islam had that stance and that's why we ourselves as muslims today have to have that stance when it comes to calls to reform islam you know because we have this many many are saying why don't we reform islam and change it to be applicable to today's times for example um, and disavow certain verses of the quran because you know they quote and quote too violent and you find this even in saudi arabia they you know they are um, using this regime this uh, criminal regime really um, to change uh, the curriculum that the children and, and the next generation are taught so that any ayat that are to do with the jihad or to do with fighting or to do with you know these are all part of islam anything to do with this they're taken away from the curriculum and they're trying to change uh, the 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 deen itself and make it uh, into a reformed deen a more christianized islam uh, that it only remains a religion based on rituals with no political dimension and you know we can't we cannot accept this you know every other way and religion or deen or other system other than islam um were able to reform and to compromise the deen because they were already falsehood but when it comes to islam it is the truth and we have to have that same mentality that same attitude that the messenger sallallahu alaihi wasallam had in in he was not willing to uh, move an inch towards falsehood and you know subhanallah we even have these voices from within the ranks of muslims telling us you know forget about khilafa forget about living under the sharia the times have changed we're in modern times and we should th- think about focusing on making our situations better and using the existing liberal framework to make our situation better even though subhanallah you know these are people who are supposedly scholars and have studied the deen you know extensively you know they should know that islam came for all times and all places and you know the fact that we all we had islam and we had the islamic system of authority less than 100 years ago so now they're coming out with claims of it not being compatible with today's times even though they may not say it like this you know the the advice they're giving us is that we shouldn't really have this uh, view of islam and these are things of the past even though we know it they're not and islam came for all all times so we as the messenger of salam had we should have this non compromise you know no compromise attitude uh, when it comes to islam and when it comes to um, establishing the whole of islam and we shouldn't compromise um like i said it just doesn't remain islam anymore when we when when we move an inch towards that falsehood as as Allah, as the messenger sallallahu alaihi wasallam really told us actually in a hadith where he said the knots of islam will be done will be undone one by one each time a knot is undone the next one will be grasped the first to be undone will be the ruling and the last will be prayer and you know what happens is that 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 is a more of a prophecy about when the ruling system is gone everything starts to you know be questioned and eventually you lose the whole of islam and when we when we start to accept this and we go on that slippery slope of accepting that parts of islam are not applicable for today's time then we're on that slippery slope to losing the whole of islam and we can't do this because this compromise is what that leads to and th- this pressure that the messenger sallam was put under he showed to us and he was that example to us that he had this non wavering uh stance and we should have the same so that was number 4 but moving on to number 5 um what happened is when the quraysh really saw that the intellectual attacks and the attacks on the ideas and mocking that that wasn't really physical but more 
um, mental attacks on, on Islam uh, weren't bearing many fruits. Uh, the Quraysh really decided to take extreme measures and uh, they they resorted to torture and persecution and even killing um, in, in many cases. Even with the Messenger وسلم, himself, he was subject to physical persecution. You know, one day the Messenger وسلم, was praying next to the Kaaba and Abu Jahl, um, he, you know, he came to the leaders of Quraysh who were also sitting next to the Kaaba. And he told them, you know, so and so has slaughtered a camel nearby. Uh, who would be who would be so bold and brave amongst you to pick up the contents of the intestines and the abdomen of that camel and dump it on uh, the messenger sallallahu alaihi wasallam during salah? Or obviously he said Muhammad, because you know, he didn't believe him to be a messenger. Um, so you know, the most evil amongst them, the most like. Well, you know, the one who had no empathy at all, Uqba bin Abu Mu'it, you know, he took on that challenge. So he went and he grabbed these intestines of the camel and, and he waited behind the, the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And as, as the Messenger went into sujood, subhanAllah, Uqba, he, uh, he, you know, put, placed all these intestines of this camel upon the back of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam while he was in sujood. And obviously, um, the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam carried on, he couldn't really move. Um, and he carried on with the salah when people saw, Muslims saw what happened to the Messenger وسلم, and they told his daughter Fatima um, and told her that you know something's happened to your father, you need to help him. And she was only a child, she was um, only about nine years old. So when she ran up and saw him, she obviously this uh, this hurt her and she immediately tried to take off the dirt off his soul, uh, shoulders and off her, her father. And when Rasulullah finished his salah, he, he stood up angrily and he, he, he made a dua publicly in front of these leaders and, and named them and shamed them really in the dua to Allah. And he, he asked Allah to you know curse them. And you know it really shows that Muhammad he would speak out against. He wouldn't turn the cheek as some people try to claim. The messenger would always turn the cheek. He wouldn't. He would speak out when he had to. And, you know, this wasn't just a messenger that was suffering this persecution. Many of the Sahaba, as we know, were subject to torture and persecution, especially those who were the most weak and vulnerable, because they were easy targets. And we all know the, the story of, you know, Yasir and Sumayyah, who were the first shuhada in Islam, um, and Bilal and others amongst you. You know, y- Yasir, the family of Yasir, uh, they weren't slaves in the true sense, but they were basically former slaves who continue to be servants to their masters and essentially they were they were like slaves but but maybe a level up if you want to say and you know they while they were um in that household they embraced islam through their son ammar and when their masters found out uh you know they the masters began to inflict them with severe punishment and torture and they would place uh the hot sand to place them in the hot sand and continually torture them and Abu Jahal would be leading the way um, in doing this so you know they would be persecuted and tortured in the heat and they would continue to remain upon Islam and not not budge and they you know the, the the Abu Jahal and others would try to just continually torture them for this and one occasion you know the messenger وسلم, walked past and saw them being tortured and he said uh, to them you know have patience, O family of Yasir, for your place of appointment is paradise, it's Jannah. And, you know, he's telling them, have that patience because, you know, you can't do anything now, but eventually, you you know, if you will get Jannah for this, this persecution that you're going through. And, you know, Sumayya was eventually killed by Abu Jahl, um, who, you know, stabbed her with, with a spear in front of her family. You know, she became the first martyr of Islam and... and, and we all should look up to her and, and what she did for Islam just in her, you know, the, the effort and the struggle she went through. And, um, you know, shortly after her husband, Yasser, was was, was killed. Um, and imagine, you know, this happened in front of the eyes of uh, Ammar, who, who was their child. And, you know, just thinking about seeing that right in front of his eyes, I don't know how, you know, the impact that could have. And subhanAllah, you know, we have the same situation today uh, in that mothers and fathers, you know, of the Palestinian children are being martyred you know by the israelis right in front of their eyes and you know imagine the impact that has on the children um, when they see this and and the physical and mental uh, scar or scar that they have when they see their own parents being murdered uh, in front of their own eyes by, by the oppressors by the occupiers and you know this really um it creates this generation that will have this hatred towards the enemies and and they won't won't forget what what they've seen with their own eyes 
And it's not just to the Israelis, you know, who've done this and, and continue to do this to this day. But even the Americans themselves, you know, they directly torture and persecute Muslims when they invade countries and occupy countries. We saw this in Iraq, in Afghanistan with Abu Ghraib, for example. There's, you know, many uh, files came out, many pictures came out showing their persecution. And even in Guantanamo Bay, for example. And subhanAllah, it just makes me wonder that sometimes, you know, we only know what we've seen in terms of what's been leaked. Think about the amount of cases that we just don't know about and they've just done without it ever being leaked or any photographs being taken. The photographs is essentially them showing off, really, and, and using this as kind of their own sadistic trophies to, to show what they have done to the Muslims. Um, and, you know, millions were killed when the US invaded Iraq in, in 2003. And they occupied Iraq and they, you know, with the case of Fallujah, they indiscriminately bombed and dropped chemical weapons on Fallujah and continued to bomb other other cities. So really it highlights that torture, persecution, killing is nothing new. And, you know, they're following in the, the steps of their, their forefathers in terms of the their enemies of Islam of before. And um, it's nothing new. We, we, we had that back then. Muslims were being killed just for saying they're Muslim, and we have that today, um, on a on a grander scale, on a greater scale. Even you know, if we think about the the recent anniversary, the twenty fifth anniversary we've had of the Srebrenica genocide, in which more than eight thousand Muslims were massacred in cold blood. You know who did this? This was the West. This was the the Serbians, and and um, you know they did do it directly. The Serbs who had this hatred for the Muslims of of Bosnia. But actually, it wasn't just them. You know, the United Nations were completely in on the act. They aided and abetted the, the persecution and they allowed it to occur right in front of their eyes. And the US and others, um, and, and Western nations, as we know, and France and UK, were also aware and, and they allowed it to happen. They aided uh, the genocide. And we shouldn't forget this, that, you know, when it comes to terrorism and who who are the biggest terrorists, you know, they have the greatest... Uh, you know, blood on their hands and, you know, little things that they place on Muslims and perhaps even have directed themselves uh, utilising certain Muslims that are confused, you know, compare, you know, don't even compare to what they have done uh, on, on a kind of a secular state level. And, you know, just really, again, highlighting that uh, they the same tactics are used today what were used in the past. Um, so moving on to number six, you know, forced conversion. We we see that um, the Quraysh would forcibly try to make the Muslims renounce Islam. And the story of Amar ibn Yasir is the one that really comes to mind where, you know, he, he saw, like I said, he saw his own parents die in front of him. And they continued to torture Amar as well. And they told him to utter words against uh, Muhammad sallam and, and, and words of kufr, really. And Ammar ibn Yasir, he buckled under the pressure. He, he, he did say the words. And later, after he woke up from the persecution and, and the torture he had been through, you know, it wasn't, it was, you know, what saddened him most and what he regretted most was what the words he said against the Messenger. And he, he straight away rushed to the Messenger and he narrated the incident and told him what he said. And subhanAllah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed the ayah where he dealed with this particular situation, saying that. One is excused to speak some words of kufr uh, under torture, um, as long as his heart is firm upon your man, and he doesn't really believe this. And you know, because Allah doesn't overburden a person, and this shows the hikmah and the, the mercy of Allah. Um, but yeah, again, it, you know, it really shows that forced conversion and trying people to renounce, you know, forcing people to renounce Islam, really was a tactic that the Quraysh, uh, you know, on uh, the Quraysh. Um, really uh, implemented and um, the story of Bilal uh, everyone knows you know it's very similar in that he would be tortured and persecuted severely and because he was a slave and he was an easy target for the Quraysh um, his master Umayyah bin Khalif would you know place him in the hot sands of the, the deserts of Mecca and place, place whole, huge boulders on the top of his back forcing him to renounce Islam and what Bilal would do would be the opposite. He would confirm his his belief in Islam and belief in Allah and Tawheed and he would utter the words that the Kuffar really hated the most. He would say, Ahadun Ahad, Ahadun Ahad, which, is, which means the one, the one. And, 
you know, the more he would be persecuted, he the stronger he would become. And once he was asked, you know, why, when you would be in torture, why would you say Ahad and Ahad, Ahad and Ahad? And Bilal said, you know, he found out that when he would say this, this word, you know, the words of Tawheed, um, when he was being asked to renounce Islam, it would make them even, you know, the most angriest and it would cause the most pain towards the Quraysh. So he continued to say it. And, you know, this shows the dehumanization that they had towards Bilal and the, the weaker Muslims and the vulnerable Muslims. Um, they would even get the children of Mecca to drag Bilal around the sand. And there was no empathy towards him. You know, he was treated as, as worse than an animal. You know, you wouldn't even do this to an animal. So this dehumanization is something that actually continues today. You know, oppressed Muslims in all parts of the world don't hold any value. You know, their, bo- their blood holds no value or weight. Uh, take for example, you know, when people die in the West and, you know, we don't wish this on anyone. We don't want any innocent people to, to, to die. But the reaction there is is very, you know, it's a huge reaction. Um, and when there's an attack, you know, when people of the West die, there's this selective outrage and it's pl- plastered over all their media outlets. But when Muslims die on a daily basis in Palestine, in Syria, in Yemen, in Burma, in Kashmir, all across the Muslim world, no one really cares. And this just really shows that dehumanization, that there's no concern for Muslims when they die because they don't really have this human quality and there's no, this, you know, naturally it's within them. They don't have that same empathy. You know, in India, for example, Muslims are being forced to renounce the Islam and utter words of kufr, very similar to what the Quraysh forced Amar to do. Even um, the Bosnian Muslims, you know, when they were killed and raped in Srebrenica, purely just for having Muslim names, you know, they weren't really... On in general, on a general level, they weren't like the most practicing, but they were still Muslim. But just for having that one identity of being Muslim, the West and the Serbs particularly, they hated it, and 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 they they killed the Muslim just for that. So it really shows again that that dehumanization of of Muslims just just for being Muslim. Even Boris Johnson himself, what did he say? You know, uh, they weren't exactly angels, these Muslims, when he was referring to the Srebrenica massacre. You know, what is he saying? That, yes, yeah, it was bad what happened in Srebrenica, but they weren't exactly angels, these Muslims. And that's his words, you know, in 1997, he, he wrote this in an article. And that really highlights that hypocrisy, that when it comes to their own, they have that concern. But when it comes to Muslims, it's that dehumanization, and not, no one cares because they don't really have... Uh, their blood just isn't worth that much or doesn't hold much value. And even when they don't explicitly want Muslims to renounce their religion or Islam, you know, they only accept a certain type of Islam. Uh, an Islam that has, you know, it's all all about your private personal worship, but has nothing to do with the political realm of life and society. Essentially a secularised version, version of Islam. You know, that's the only Islam they're willing to accept, if 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 that even. So moving on to number seven, uh, really, is something we will speak about a bit more. And uh, I don't want to go into too much detail because it's probably for a future episode is economic boycott. You know, we will speak about it further. But uh, the Quraysh, when they saw that um, certain tribes were still supporting and protecting the Muslims, uh, particularly Banu Hashim, who was the the tribe of Muhammad Sallam and and the link tribe Banu Mutalib, uh, they placed an economic boycott on these tribes as well as the Muslims. And 40 leaders of the Quraysh, they drew up a, a document and they forbade anyone to marry uh, from these tribes, um, anyone to s- do any transaction or sale with these tribes and buying from these tribes. And, you know, they they um, held this boycott for, for a long period. And they said basically that this boycott will be in place until uh, you take away your protection away from Muhammad Sallallahu or... You, or Muhammad Sassam in himself renounces prophethood, his claim to prophethood. So this obviously caused a great deal of hardship for the Muslims, and they were on the brink of starvation, pretty much. Um, and the only way they were saved were through sympathizers from the Meccans who would send food to them, and eventually they broke the uh, the boycott. And we will, inshallah, we'll speak about this a bit further in a future episode. But again, this was a tactic used by the Quraysh then. But if we draw parallels with today... Uh, we find that the US and other nations loyal to the US, uh, they place economic sanctions on Muslim nations, such as Turkey and Iran, 
um, in order to suppress their economies and, and and you know ensure that the Muslims don't gain any upper hand or, or, or the economies become too strong or the you know investment in certain energy doesn't become a, a tool for the Muslims in the future. And similar sanctions were actually placed on Palestine at one point, um, where the the authority there and the government there and even Hamas they were try, they were forced to recognize the state of Israel and that you know they're forced not to be able to ever kind of um, say that Israel doesn't have a right to exist and you know this was through sanctions so again what we find is that these sanctions that the Quraysh did economic boycott even though it's at more of a simplistic level because the, the the society was a bit more simplistic it happens still happens today but more on a national level uh, to entire countries on a, on a different scale um, but it's to achieve the same thing it's to kind of cause the Muslims to um, harm and starve the Muslims but also destroy their economy and their ability to trade and things like this just on a grander scale and very similar happens when Muslim nations are made to become indebted to the West through like the IMF loans that we have and the West uh, the sorry the World Bank loans um, the the Muslim nations become indebted towards the US and the West and these aren't uh, institutions that are neutral. These, you know, these institutions are fully in place to aid uh, the West, and they're not humanitarian. You know, they're mechanisms to keep the economies of the Muslims indebted to the U.S. so that they have no economic will of their own. You know, and this is something another way that um, Muslim nations um, are, you know, are pushed down and suppressed so that they don't rise in the future and although many of their leaders of these Muslim nations are agents of America and they do whatever America asks you know these actions actually impact the Ummah it impact the Ummah directly in terms of starving them of any kind of um, prosperity but also you know utilizing the Ummah's resources and indebted Muslim nations and making them pay large amounts in interest this all impacts the Ummah at large and it will you know, hampen our revival and uh, becoming a stronger nation in the future, inshallah. And that is why you find with Turkey, there is this uh, issue that many of the West have because they are starting to create this independent will that, uh, you know, the the West are f- afraid of. And that's why you find that they really attempted to bring Turkey back into line, uh, into the, the orbit of America, so to speak, so so that we don't gain that strength. Um, so the final one, and I think I did say there were nine, but actually, um, just looking at my notes, there, there were eight categories that um, I, I uh, have uh, defined or categorised. I'm sure there'll be more and we could probably cut it different ways, but um, number eight was really the final one. Again, we'll speak about it further, but driving the Muslims out of their land was another technique that the uh, the Quraysh utilised. And you know what they would do is they would cause a, a, such an environment and create such an environment that the Muslims themselves were forced to leave the land and many even migrated to Abyssinia as we know especially those who didn't have protection those who didn't have uh, support in, in Mecca so they were forced to leave uh, because of the situation out of their own homeland and you know again we'll speak about it further in, in future episodes but this is another example of hostility against the Muslims and today we have something very similar you know whether it be in Palestine for example where slowly through aggressive uh, illegal settlement of Israel uh, you know across all of uh, Palestine but more recently in the West Bank for example uh, you know what they've done is they, they they illegally settle so that Muslims are forced out of the land and the environment is made really hostile so the Palestinians don't want to live there and they slowly Israeli slowly start taking over the land and you know this they want to eventually take over that whole land likewise in India uh, they used legislation to change and uh, ensure that the citizenship of Muslims is removed. So they become like refugees, eventually either to kind of remove all their rights as citizens of the state, but also so that the Muslims leave the land and the the Indians are able to spread the Hindutva ideology, for example. Um, in other Muslim lands, the US has directly used their military might and, and chaos to reshape demographics. In, in these lands and whether they be bombing or um, trying to take in armies um, to cause demographic shifts in the, in the population you know all of this is to fragment lands and divide the Muslims and drive them out and, and in order to create their own kind of Middle East 
So what we find is that even though the creator, the creator would do this, you know, again on a smaller scale, but today we find something very similar, you know, the Muslims are driven out of their lands um, and, and, you know, caused to divide and make them weaker. Because if the Muslims are scattered around, you know, it make, make, makes the Muslims weaker. If the Muslims have that, don't have that stability and are constantly battling against chaos and destruction, you know, it weakens the Muslims' resolve and it weakens our strength because we're not, we don't have that stability to kind of come together and this is deliberate and this is what they did back then and, and they do today so alhamdulillah i think um, you know we spoke about eight different reasons uh, of what, what the tactics that um, the enemies of allah employed then the Quraysh employed and you know subhanallah we saw that the enemies of allah today and enemies of islam today they employ very similar um but maybe to a greater scale and and to a different different extent uh, in, in in some cases but the basis of the attacks are very similar um, and this is really important as I was saying at the start of the episode that you know we are not going through going through anything anything new in essence the basis of what the Messenger and the Sahaba went through we are also going through so what that really means is that you know our solutions to overcome these problems can be found in the seerah because Muhammad and his sahaba they overcame these problems and these challenges and although our reality is different today and the time is different we still should refer back to how the Messenger overcame these not only because um, they're very similar but also because it's an obligation our you know that he is the best of example examples and it is the only route to uh, salvation and only route to kind of solving the problems permanently you know the, the situation is dire for the muslims today in in all all over the world uh, across the muslim world and it is saddening it is difficult to kind of witness but we have to sincerely ask ourselves you know what will solve the problem what does allah and his messenger sallallahu alaihi wasallam require from us and only then can we actually make a, a real change uh, take the example we spoke about with the asr on sumayya you know the messenger sallallahu alaihi wasallam directly witnessed the torture and persecu- persecution you know he, he it hurt him it harmed him he didn't want to see it but he wasn't distracted he didn't you know start to do charity for them he didn't start lobbying the Quraysh he didn't get distracted from his real mission because he knew that in fact only through implementing his real mission and and, and finding an, uh, you know um, establishing an authority that eventually came in Medina could he actually uh, solve the situation permanently? Even though, you know, Yasin and Sumay, they, they died in the end. And, you know, this didn't sway the Messenger of from what he had to do. He continued the da'wah, right? And he eventually established that authority in Medina, which a few years after, he came with an army, army and he liberated the whole of Mecca. You know, this really shows that this was the, the you know, this was the vision of the Messenger of Islam. This was the mission and likewise, we need to understand that any other cause that goes against this mission or is a temporary action is just taking us away from the true duty that we have. So, you know, charity or lobbying governments or petitioning or anything, anything else for that matter, you know, these just distract us from the actual solution. And we must have that single cause of you know continuing the mission of the messenger system to implement islam in order to solve the problem altogether all of these other smaller problems are just symptoms and only when we recognize how to solve the problem permanently by following the mission of the messenger system will we be able to solve the problem and that's not to say we shouldn't give sadaqah and do things that are allowed that we are allowed to do um, but we should recognize that sadaqah is not the solution and it was never a solution in the entire series you will never find where Muhammad used sadaqah to solve a political problem or a solution for the ummah um, and many even today I have many friends that will acknowledge that sadaqah is not the solution but you know the question I really have is sometimes they all their effort is in this space all their time and effort is then you know they do want to help the, the heart is in the right place they want to help Muslims but we have to ask ourselves is this diverting us away from the true uh, mechanism for change the true mission and are we giving enough time to that which will permanently solve the problem likewise many call for petitions and lobbying of governments and institutions right to solve the problem which is within this liberal framework like i was uh, i spoke about earlier 
And it really, um, um, you know, surprises me because, you know, lobbying and petitioning the very same governments who are responsible for the problem in the first place, I don't know how that will solve the problem. And it really just wastes our efforts, wastes the zeal of the Muslims. The Muslims want to make change, but all they are given are these um, kind of futile activities that won't have any real change um, and are made to feel like they've done their bit. And they want, you know, the enemies of Allah, they want to cause that environment of distraction and diversionary activity so that, you know, it keeps Muslims away from that true, real activity and that true duty that we have. So, alhamdulillah, I think we've discussed a lot. I want to, you know, hopefully, inshallah, conclude on what we've discussed. Um, so, you know, and I really want to conclude on a, on a hadith uh, that really should highlight to us what we need to be doing, you know, that only when we fulfill our duties to Allah will the victory of Allah come. You know, there was a story of Kabab ibn Arath uh, radiallahu anhu. He was a Sahabi who, who basically um, was also subject to persecution and torture and he he witnessed it directly um and whilst in this hostile situation one day he approached the messenger while the messenger was leaning against the kaaba and he said you know oh rasulullah why don't you make dua for us you know and he what he meant by that is why don't you make dua to allah to make it easier for us to take the pain away and what was the messenger sallallahu response you know he sat up straight his face turned red, you know, he became quite angry. And he said, you know, the believers in the times before you, you know, they used to have be combed with iron combs, such that their flesh would be separated from their nerves and their bones. Uh, but they would never desert their religion. They would never leave their religion. And then they would bring one of them and place a saw on top of their heads and they would be cut into two halves. And yet they would never give up their religion. In the name of Allah, Allah will give victory to his deen until a traveller will go from Sana'a all the way to Hadramaut, fearing no one but Allah. So what, Allah, what, what can we take from this hadith? You know, Rasulullah is telling Kabab ibn Arad that we must have sabr. And he's telling us, you know, we have to have sabr. Even if we're going through a lot, even if it becomes unbearable, we can't give up and we need to continue to have that sabr uh, but when we say sabr, you know, what do we mean? And many actually mistran mistranslate sabr to mean patience. And patience sometimes implies doing nothing, just to bear it. But this is wrong. What, what sabr really means is that perseverance, that we don't get distracted. We continue what we need to do. Um, and we don't become hopeless. And we don't you know, become uh, pessimistic and uh, lose hope. Because actually if we continue with the actions we need to do and we persevere and do those required actions, Allah will inshallah eventually send his victory because we'd be worthy of that victory. So, you know, our situation can and it will change, but we must look back to how the Messenger of Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam changed the situation and overcame a very similar situation that we find ourselves in today. And that's what we try to demonstrate today, that everything that they went through back then and the Sahaba went through, and the messenger went through, we're not going through that much that is dissimilar. So if that is the case, and the messenger out, you know, overcame this, we ourselves can overcome this by you know, going back to the seerah, going back to the sunnah, and understanding what we need to do. You know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah An-Nur, uh, Allah has promised those who have believed among you to do right and done righteous deeds, that he will surely grant them succession, and authority upon the earth just as he granted to, to those before him uh, before them and that he will surely establish for them therein their deen which he has preferred for them and that he will surely substitute for them after their fear security for they worship me not associating anything with me but whoever disbelieves after that then those are the defiant disobedient so Allah is telling us that he will give us authority and security but only if we do the right actions if we do those deeds uh, that will change the situation permanently and we persevere with the mission of the Messenger وسلم, and recognize that every other cause that we're adopting, that people adopt, just going with the flow of things, you know, is a distraction and is, is a diversion from that real duty, uh, that real mission. So Alhamdulillah, I think, you know, we've discussed quite a lot and uh, we've gone well over the time. So 
uh, inshallah i pray that you have benefited from this episode inshallah and you know please as i always say please share this with others so that others can benefit and you know like like our pages on social media that we have all you know we're on all the platforms jazakallah uh, khairun for listening assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh thanks for watching that video for more exclusive videos please like share and subscribe to our channel don't forget you can listen to some of our shows wherever you are because we're also available on all popular podcast platforms and for more voice of the ummah content make sure you check out the links to all of our social media platforms in the description below